Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books, where each week we interview an author of a newly published work of nonfiction that we believe is worth your time. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the University of Texas Brownsville or this station. And now, here is your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, Associate Professor of Communication at the University of Texas at Brownsville and Texas Southmost College. And with me today, calling from England, is Mr. Nigel Cliff, a historian, biographer, and critic. His first book, The Shakespeare Riots, was selected one of the best nonfiction books of the year by the Washington Post. He lives in London with his wife, the ballerina Viviana Durante, and their son. The book we're here to talk about today is a notable book by the Book Review of the New York Times, Notable Book of the Year, and it's entitled The Last Crusade, The Epic Voyages of Vasco da Gama. Mr. Cliff, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. This is a wonderful read because it reads like literature all the way through. It's it's as if reading a novel. Beautiful descriptions of everything, very vivid. But let's talk first about the context for Vasco da Gama's voyages because I, I really found it interesting all that was going on from the time of the founding of Islam uh, the politics of the era, the five kingdoms of Spain early on that were just a bunch of disjoint kingdoms before Portugal became a, a separate entity? Right. I mean, Spain and Portugal, of course, had been mostly under Islamic control for nearly seven centuries before the Age of Discovery began. Mm-hmm. Uh, we forget, I think, that, that the, the, the Islamic armies that came out of Arabia in, in the seventh century burst into North Africa and then crossed uh, the Straits of Gibraltar to Spain, and were pretty much at the gates of Paris by the time uh, they were finally turned back. So this was a part of the world that had been under Islamic domination for for, for centuries, uh, and the Christian reconquest of Iberia uh, really was the the guiding force behind the the, the whole crusading movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I personally don't see that there's a, a great difference between the crusading movement and the Age of Discovery that followed, in the sense that these two nations that had had fought back against Islam on their home ground, were really the two nations that spearheaded uh, a global crusade by by ship against uh, the heartlands of Islam uh, a few centuries later. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as they are forming these five areas of Spain, are forming uh, their own kingdoms, uh, one of the things you wrote, and I can't remember where it is in the book, somewhere early on, uh, that... um, uh, after the expulsion of the Moors, they had no real enemy to fight, and so that kind of left them listless for a while. Yeah, I mean, they did fight each other for quite some time. Portugal and its neighbor were, were, were really quite bitter enemies for centuries, but when peace was finally uh, in some way scratched out between the two of them, they, they really didn't have anywhere to practice their nightly skills. You have, of course, a, a huge class of expensively equipped and trained knights running around uh, rather dangerously, if they don't have anything to do. So they, they of course, looked abroad to to North Africa, where the the Arabs uh, and, and their allies had, had fled from, from Spain and Portugal. And this is really why Portugal was, was the first to engage in, in the business of exploring the world, I think. Spain came later because uh, there was still the, the Muslim Emirate of Granada on its borders to attack. Mm-hmm. Portugal only had the Atlantic Ocean and the Spanish Christians uh, bordering it. And so it was the first to look across the seas for uh, new lands. If you look uh, at uh, almost a millennium and a half of history, and this this area, the known world, Europe and and, uh, Western Asia, and what little they did know of Africa, the known world, and Jerusalem considered the center of the world at the time, it's almost as though there's an expansion of Islam controlling and then a uh, contraction as uh, Western Christendom comes back. And so it, it seems to ebb and flow as to who's dominating the, the known world in a particular time. It did, but I think since the fall of the Roman Empire, Islam had been by far the most dominant force. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, was, there was a big setback, well, I mean, it's rather understating it, when the Mongols came streaming out of, of, of Northern Asia uh, in, in the 13th century. But... Essentially, I think Europe had been put in a straitjacket for a thousand years after the fall of Rome. It had very little knowledge of Asia, very little knowledge indeed of Africa. Of course, the Americas didn't exist then, so it was really boxed in on the western side of the world mm-hmm. with, with, without many clear avenues to, to explore to the east. The way was pretty compre- comprehensively blocked for most of this period by, 
the strength of Islam. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, the fall of Constantinople, which was the birthplace of Orthodox uh, Western Christendom uh, to, to the Islamics, had, had its effect. But so you mentioned so did uh, St. Augustine's uh, writings who, f- who could frame the concept of a just war for people in a way that they could accept that there is a certain Christian right <laughs> in fighting wars to, uh, to, um, uh, for something other than, than, than wealth. <laughs> Absolutely. There was, there was the, the concept of, of a, a ruler's right, uh, or indeed obligation, to defend his people, which Augustine was one of the first Christian theologians to frame. And when the Crusades came along, the Crusades, of course, being one of those pushes and pulls that you refer to, but if you look at the, the actual extent that the Crusades got into Asia, it was, it was very small. It was really a, a bit of shoreline in, um, on the eastern Mediterranean, to put it in a global context. But this, this, this Augustinian doc, doctrine was, 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 of course, still, still very much referred to at that time, and indeed 500 years later when, when the Age of Discovery was in full swing. Mm-hmm. And with the Crusades came the emergence of the Knights Templar, which That's was right. a very influential group, yes? It sure was. I mean, this was one of the most feared outfits in the world. And again, uh, a group of essentially knights who took religious vows, who, when the Crusaders were expelled from the Holy Land towards the end of the 13th century, finally, really had nowhere to go. And uh, where some of them went, in fact, was Portugal and Spain. And the money that w- that was this great, the great wealth of the Knights Templar eventually came down to a figure called Henry the Navigator, who was the father of the whole age of discovery. And he, it was the money of, of, of the Knights that was put to work in exploring the world, not purely for unselfish reasons, but, but certainly, you know, there was a religious element to that. Well, Prince Henry uh, uh, was vastly influential in this. Let's say a little bit more about what he contributed to the exploration of the world. I mean, Prince Henry is one of these mythical, mythical figures who different ages have seen in different ways. The 19th century saw him as this, this great hero, this visionary, and many Portuguese still do. Uh, the truth, as usual, is a bit more messy than that. He was a, was, was a real um, hot-blooded crusader, went crusading in North Africa and Morocco, many times during his life, or trying to, many times. Uh, and really, this, this, the business of exploration started off as a bit of a sideline, probably uh, started off as piracy. Then he came across a few islands and realized that this was a way to increase his wealth. And, and then this extraordinary rapid development happens that over the period of really a, a few short decades, the, the Portuguese start pushing down the, the west coast of Africa through the Atlantic into the southern Atlantic, and on towards the, the tip of Africa. Uh, of course, at the time, it was, it was sort of impossible to sail around Africa, and it was thought that there were all sorts of terrible impediments in the way that the, the equator was a, a ring of scorching fire and that ships couldn't approach the land because shallows reached out into the seas, or even that giants would scoop them out of, out of the sea and, and hold them up in the sky. I mean, there, there were sailors' tales and there were... Uh, strong religious beliefs that, that that made many believe this was an impossible mission, and no one had tried it before. Mm-hmm. They they were afraid of of cyclops too over there, weren't they? <laughs> they sure were. I mean, that, that, you know, there, there were there were endless stories. Some put about by, I think, Arab traders in Africa to stop them from coming near. Mm-hmm. Some the results of confusion of travelers' tales of of all these myths that had creeped in during the Middle Ages when Europe really hadn't had the web at all to explore beyond its borders, and a lot of the knowledge, I have to say, of even the Roman era mm-hmm. had been lost. This was, a way, in some ways, a recovery, and, and, and then a great advance on information that, that, that had been known and lost more than a thousand years earlier. And it's an interesting time because Henry the Crusader becomes Henry the Navigator and gets a bunch of cartographers together to map out what they think the world looks like at the time. And you have some marvelous color plates here that show how far off they were in some of those early yeah. maps. I mean, there are some wonderful illustrations that I was able to get in the book mm-hmm. that, that show showed a world that's unrecognizable. But as you said before, with Jerusalem, uh, the bullseye of, the, of a sort of circular... Of, of a plate-shaped globe, of, of a, a globe is the wrong word, of a, plate, of a, of a circular flat world mm-hmm. with three continents divided by three great rivers all flowing from the Garden of Eden. I mean, 
this was what the people who were exploring the world had to contend with. There was there was there wasn't just a lack of knowledge. There was actually an alternative system of knowledge which was very strongly in place, and people had to fight against this this, this very strong illusion that the world was shaped according to Christian geography. Mm-hmm. And uh, the influence of Christianity was really important to some of those legends. Uh, the fable of Prester John just amazes me. The, the <laughs> Portuguese never gave up on this guy. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was a legend that went around for centuries. He was firmly believed to be an enormously rich and powerful king who lived in the East somewhere and had lost contact with Western Europe some centuries before. Most people thought that he was several hundred years old, that he had a million-strong army, he had a, a giant table made of emerald at which hundreds of kings and bishops uh, dined every night. He, he was a, an enormous piece of wishful thinking, I think, mm-hmm. uh, and a, an, an ally with whom the, the Europeans could, could gang up against the power of Islam and hope to dominate the world. And when the Portuguese went sailing with Vasco de Gama in charge into the Indian Ocean, to India and, and beyond, they asked for this Prester John at every stop. They really thought they were going to find him. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, King John's offspring, Henry, was very influential as we move into the middle of the 15th century, but it was really an ambitious king by the name of Manuel that, that drove uh, the efforts that wound up sending Vasco da Gama around Africa, yes? That's right. Uh, a rather religious figure mm-hmm. who, uh, in contrast to his predecessor, who, who, who was much more interested, I think, in the potential rewards of, of the voyage in financial terms. Uh, and probably, for that reason, the right person for this time, because nobody really believed in Portugal that there were great riches to be won by sailing all the way to India. Most people believed it was impossible, it would end in disaster, that the cost was so high that uh, the country would lose out, or, or any of the other perfectly reasonable reasons not to go herring on this wild trip halfway around the world. And I think the fact that it was framed as God's will, as a crusading mission by King Manuel, really it was what convinced the country to embark on this mm-hmm. seemingly impossible journey. And, of course, influenced by uh, the lure of the East, the, the value of spices and herbs and the precious jewels that seem to be in great abundance in Asia is, is part of what drew this that, that's right. I mean, of course, there, has to, there are mixed motives, as in everything, and greed and a desire for advancement, um, a perfectly reasonable desire to, to increase the wealth of the nation. I mean, these, these were all very strong motives. But I think not the entire story. Venice was, was, was getting very rich off the back of the spice trade at this time. Mm-hmm. But the Venetians just bought their spices from... Egypt from the great old port of Alexandria, which was a short trip from from their port, from their shores. Mm -hmm. The idea of this incredibly dangerous voyage, which takes you 24,000 miles there and back, halfway around the world, uh, in order to corner the spice trade, I think that certainly you have to pay for it. The idea of the the, the great wealth that could be garnered from spices, I think it was understood, could pay for these voyages and make uh, turn a profit. But I don't think they were the whole story. I think they were, in a way, to some extent, a means to an end. Yeah, they, they sort of helped fund the whole thing. Interesting, the yeah. Venetians buying from, from Egypt. Of course, you pay duties uh, going overland to bring the spices in Syria and other locations. And so the prices were pretty high. And what you avoid with the sea route is you avoid paying the duties of crossing overland with the spices. That's right, because the spices, the origin of the spices really wasn't known. It was I mean, buried far away in the distant past. Only Marco Polo really had, a couple of centuries before, hinted at the existence of the Spice Islands in the, Indonesia. But uh, it was certainly known that there, were, there was an enormous chain through which these spices came, and at every port, at every sultan's lands that the, the, the camel trains crossed, um, it, the dues had to be paid. Mm-hmm. Customs duties were pretty exorbitant, and and then the Venetians went and slapped a you know, triple profit on top of that, and it was pretty ruinous for most of Europe. So it, it was certainly thought possible that a ship could take this enormously long journey and still return uh, 
an undercut the Venetians. Mm-hmm. And n- now, spices were valued, obviously, for enhancing flavor, but they were pharmaceutical. Uh, they helped uh, freshen the smell of inner cities in Europe. Uh, are those pharmaceutical uses documented? Yeah. Did they actually work for antidotes to poison and gout <laughs> and epilepsy and rheumatism and all of that? Well, if you, I mean, it's a bit like alternative medicine today. Some people were certain that they were effective and some people were a bit skeptical and if you look carefully in the records you do find some doctors sort of quietly saying to their clients that actually if you go and pick this common herb from the garden it's probably just as effective as swallowing a bunch of you know powdered pearls mixed with with cinnamon and nutmeg and i i, I think that there, there was a there was a, a sort of rarity value of course in these things it was it was a bit like going to an expensive spa. It made you feel better because it was ex- exclusive and it smelled nice. And there was a sort of holistic goodness about them, I suppose, that, that in, a, in an age when medicines didn't really exist, made people feel that they were at least doing everything they could to, to improve their health. So spices, um, uh, avid Christendom, uh, uh, possible wealth from jewels as well, uh, plus beating the competition... Uh, late 15th century, we emerge as Portugal being the ones who are going to find the route to the Indies. How did uh, Vasco da Gama emerge as the most important figure in that? Well, there's a question mark over what happened in the decade before he emerged, because the last voyage was conducted by Bartholomew Diaz, who reached the southern tip of Africa, finally, Mm -hmm. after these decades of attempts. Then things go quiet for 10 years, 10 years during which Columbus convinces the Spanish that he has this great alternative plan to reach the east by sailing west, and comes back, not really with any uh, huge evidence, that, uh, certainly no spices, but, but certainly evidence that he's found something. So the pressure's now on Portugal to respond and to confirm that its uh, route to, to the east, by the east, so to speak, is, is, is the correct one. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a mystery in the light of that why Vasco da Gama was chosen, because he was a fairly young man, I think 28 when he was chosen. Uh, he hasn't got any prominent record of, of achievement at that point. Maybe a captain of a couple of little voyages or a little bit of work for the king. And um, he, he wasn't a, a prominent figure at court. So nobody really knows is the answer, mm-hmm. and, and including all of the Spanish chronic, Portuguese chroniclers themselves who come up with different reasons. One just says that the king saw him walking through the room and, and took a liking to him and decided to appoint him captain. So the, I think the most likely answer is that he had seen some service. Uh, he, he was seen as a reliable figure. Um, a man of courage, a, a man of some temper who could control the crew, mm-hmm. educated enough to to engage in diplomacy with kings on the other side of the world if if necessary, uh, and and also that there was no one better who wanted to go because it was thought by most people that that these people would these sailors would not come back home, and that's a good prediction given the woes that they face on this on this trip but let's let's take on our, our three voyages uh with da gama uh he was beset by many a challenge from weather to uh unfriendlies to tragedies of all kinds and illness and it's amazing that he made it the, the first time in particular not knowing it sure is i mean this great sweep around the atlantic that he took which no one had done before reaching the the Cape of Good Hope after three months on the open seas. This is the time when, you know, you have to take food on, on, on board um, that, that's going to perish fairly quickly, especially when you're crossing the equator, and water that's going to run out quite fast on a on a small ship, uh, 110 feet long, these ships were. Um, so you can imagine after three months the state of one of these vessels. Then when they, they touch land, they, they encounter tribes that have never been encountered before. They don't know whether they're friendly or hostile. They sail into the Indian Ocean in a completely uncharted part of the world, not knowing what any of the features to look for on the coast, not having any idea where to navigate. Uh, diseases, of course, you know, scurvy and uh, and tropical diseases that were unknown then. This was an, an extraordinary trip, and at the end of it, it wasn't really known whether friend or foe would be waiting. And how is it that this little nation 
uh, built ships that were able to make this trip and uh, had the cannons that they needed? And was it just part of history at the time? Yeah, I mean, this is another canard about the Portuguese, that they were somehow master shipbuilders. They had started traveling out into the Atlantic some a couple of centuries before the voyage, but they, they were not especially expert shipbuilders, certainly not compared to the Venetians or the Genoese who churned out ships by the dozen. Uh, and I think the, 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 the plain truth is that the ships that Vasco da Gama sailed on were no better or worse than any other strongly built merchant ship that was used for lugging goods around Europe. Um, and, and another reason why, you know, it's such an extraordinary achievement mm -hmm. that these little boats, which were, which were pretty, pretty resilient, um, but were not intended for voyages of anything like that length, managed to survive. And uh, even though they faced hardships, uh, people dying of scurvy, wormholes uh, in the wood after a, a long period of time that had to be plugged with sticks and recalked, um, they made it. And they, they discovered some things like the winter monsoon is the time to cross the, the Indian Ocean and things like that. That's right. I mean, sometimes they would have to haul the ship up onto the shore empty all the stuff out, and really set to work on the hull, which would be a bit of a sieve by that point, being you know, full of barnacles and, and covered in, as you say, little little wormholes. So these, these, these ships needed sort of rebuilding along the way. Um, and so they dragged their way along at an inevitably fairly slow pace, um, and, and really um, mapped out this whole region of the world for the first time for Europeans. Mm -hmm. As they went along the coast, they took very careful charts, and um, and and this was this this was what enabled Europeans to redraw the map uh, very soon afterwards. As you mentioned, that there are these old maps in my book. The startling change you see about two or three years after this voyage, mm -hmm. suddenly the world starts becoming recognizable. His stops in northern India the first time uh, when he thought maybe he had made allies turned out not to be such uh, friendly allies, and there was subterfuge and trickery, all, all especially from uh, Calicut, right? Yes. I mean, we, we, we got the east coast of Africa where he's you know, nearly ambushed and uh, boarded at night and, and caught in various traps, manages to escape to, uh, across the Indian Ocean to Calicut, which is really the destination all along. This is the, the epicenter of the Indian spice trade, uh, fabulously wealthy city, controlled by a very rich king called the Zamorin. Mm -hmm. uh, and Vasco da Gama and his king expected the Zamorin to give him a very warm welcome because they thought that he was a Christian, and they thought that his kingdom was Christian, and in fact that the whole of India was pretty much Christian. And this was a sort of extraordinary, I, can, I guess again, piece of wishful thinking, that that most of India would somehow welcome its long-lost brothers from Western Europe, its brothers in, in, in faith, and, and hand over spices to them for not very much money and ally with them um, against, uh, against the Islam. So it was, it was with great expectations that they arrived in, in Calicut, in this huge port city, and set out on a long trek by river and land to the king's the king's court. And, and, and what happened after that was a series of disappointments. They were uh, welcomed with, with great festivities, but it soon turned out they hadn't brought much of a tribute, that there was no gold on their ships or anything of any value, which was not, not the way you were supposed to come and greet the great Calicut, of, uh, the great Samarin of Calicut. So all sorts of misunderstandings followed, uh, and kidnappings and, 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 and hostile standoffs. Uh, and really, Vasco da Gama escaped from, from that place with, um, just with the skin of his teeth. Mm -hmm. But he returned more resolute on his second voyage with uh, a lot more ships. He did. Uh, he had been, I suppose, not humiliated the first time round uh, because he had opened up this incredibly important sea route to the east and uh, he, he had proof that spices were really there. Uh, and he brought back Indians as well, hostages to prove it. Um, but he had been treated rather roughly by the Zamorin, and, and, and there was this great disappointment that 
this alliance hadn't been forged with uh, with which the Portuguese could push on really up India and uh, if uh, as they hoped uh, to Arabia and even Jerusalem itself. So Vasco da Gama was sent back with a large fleet of warships at his command the second time really to cow the Indians into submission if they didn't play along with who with people who were still thought to be their religious brothers there's brothers. There was no real understanding that Hinduism was a separate religion. It was thought to be some sort of corrupt cousin of Christianity, even a few years after Vasco da Gama's voyage. Mm -hmm. And now we reach a point where Chris, Christopher Columbus is falling out of favor because he's just not, uh, he has not delivered on what he promised. And uh, uh, But there is a point where he thinks he's going to enter Par Eden. <laughs> and um, Yes. He was Christopher Columbus was a, was a religious man, and he wore the cloaks of a simple religious man. And at one point on his voyages, he uh, thought that he was sailing in some way up a, a giant hillside, up a, uh, in, in, in the upstream of a large river that was flowing down um, a hillside. And it had such force to it that he thought it could only come from the Garden of Eden, as we know, which was supposed to be the the spring of the great rivers of the world. Mm -hmm. And he ran away in, 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 in fear, really, at that point. Um, so Columbus was still uh, on his third voyage when, he, when really Spain had uh, started to suspect that he was something of a fraudulent figure, was, was still embarked on the same religious tradition that the Portuguese were, but uh, rather in the wrong place. Yes, and because they, 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 he never found a way to through the Pacific Ocean himself, that was left to Magellan some years later. And he, uh, uh, while his star was waning, Gama's star was rising, and he became well-respected and appreciated after his second voyage. That's right. Uh, I mean, he became a rich man, and eventually, although he had to fight for it, uh, a titled man, and one of the grand figures of Portugal. It, there, there was some uh, politicking at the court which... Uh, meant that he was was not automatically granted the favours. He had to push for them. He was quite a pushy man. He didn't stop before he'd achieved what he wanted. One reason I think why he was successful in his in, on this extraordinary voyage, uh, a man of extraordinary determination, um, and and he got what he wanted. He became a, a, a great and powerful figure uh, to su such an extent that when some. 20 years after his second voyage, the Portuguese empire that he had founded, had, which had reached Indonesia uh, and, and was reaching out to China and Japan, um, started to come unstuck and became a sort of bit of a, a forerunner of the Wild West, you know, with sort of captains shooting up each other's ships for, for gold. Vasco da Gama was sent out on his third voyage to sort out the whole sorry mess, and he came along as as an iron disciplinarian who was determined to protect his legacy and and turn this this empire into something that could be properly managed uh, he he died as it happens in india before he was able to carry out much of his great plan but one wonders whether it wasn't beyond any one person here you have tiny portugal a country of maybe a million people at this time sending huge numbers of its young men halfway across the world to uh, to run an empire which becomes very quickly separate from the its its mother land there's no real way that the portuguese king can control places that are 12 15000 miles from his shores so i think it, the empire became very ungovernable and the english and the uh, the dutch were really the beneficiaries because they learned that the best way to exploit the spice trade was not on great religious crusades or attempts to build enormous empires in the name of one country, but by setting up commercial companies to exploit them as ruthlessly as they could. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I didn't get a chance to, to discuss with you something I wanted to about the discipline of Vasco da Gama and the consequences of not uh, you know, towing the line on, on what's expected in terms of morality and the punishments right. of people, uh, both his his conquered provinces and his his men suffered right. under the hand of his stern discipline uh and the violence of 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 the the of Albuquerque and uh 
de Gama and his men uh, cutting off noses and ears of conquered people. Just uh, it, it's there's some vivid descriptions in here, and I came to a greater understanding of a point in history that I hadn't known before. So I, I commend you for the style in which you wrote and the thoroughness with which you've uh, presented us with this wonderful book, The Last so Crusade. Much. So we've been talking with Nigel Cliff from England. The Last Crusade, The Epic Voyages of Vasco da Gama is a good read. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening. If you missed part of this or any other show, or you just want to share a good book with a friend, like us on Facebook at Good Books Radio Show.